I've got three spicy clips for you today. Firstly, Dan Ives just laid out why 2026 could be a huge year for Tesla. Then in clip two, we've got the CEO of Boston Dynamics talking about humanoid robots doing real factory work. And I think there's a connection here between those two stories that's worth exploring. And finally, we're going to see Dan Ives' top five stock picks for 2026. Enjoy. Tesla, 600. Um, it's not a car story. Do you see 800? Do you see 1,000? Would that be crazy or no? I mean, that's where no. it's headed. Base case, 600, bull case, 800. I mean, to me, when it comes to Tesla, that's one, like, this is the most important year, I'd say, for Musk, maybe ever, because of autonomous, because of robotics, because of where they're heading down this AI path. I mean, to some extent, this is... It's a it's an extremely important time for Tesla because, look, there's obviously competition across the board. Some could argue NVIDIA is a competitor, but I just believe when it comes to the autonomous world, they're going to own 80 percent of the market when it's all said and done. But 30 cities, you need robo taxis this year. It's integral, you know, in, in terms of the uh, the Tesla story. Yeah, I mean, I know they started in Austin, and that was one of the reasons why you were so positive on this name, because they saw that, and you said 30 cities coming for the robo-tax. You had $2 trillion market cap over the coming year. Bull case scenario, $3 trillion market cap by the end of 2026. Let me ask you this. So with the robo-taxi story, is it rolling out as quickly as you had hoped? And will people really be comfortable going in a robo taxi it's like asking are you comfortable using stable coin in retail um how quickly do you think that this could be adopted i mean i don't know that i'm ready to get into a car without a driver are you and how quickly well, do you i am these and, robo and I, yeah i know you are you probably already rode in it 20 times but are people going to adopt this and are is this rollout going as quickly as you would hope and if not would you get on the phone and tell te and tell musk speed it up Look, but see, I view it as I like that they're doing it brick by brick carefully because you're dealing with lives, right? So they got to make sure that everything is right. And and I'd rather think it's more important in terms of the way they build it out, making sure it's safe and making sure that as the geospace area expands in the right way rather than just quick. Now, look, Austin's expanding nicely. We're going to go to California. But like I said, like, you really want to see 30 cities to get to scale on the robo-taxi side. Uh, is, why do people say Waymo's better than Tesla? And is that not true? Look, Waymo's had a huge, it's had a huge start, and they have a phenomenal technology. My whole thing is that Tesla, no one will match the scale and scope of robo-taxis eventually. But look, like I've said about Waymo, Waymo is another reason to be bullish in Alphabet. It's not factored in. Tesla's fleet generates more driving data in a single weekend than Waymo collects in an entire quarter, and that advantage compounds every single day. So Dan's making his prediction about robotaxis in dozens of cities by 2026. And yeah, that sounds very aggressive, but the thing people keep overlooking is the data advantage Tesla has already built. Every Tesla on the road is feeding the system. Rain, snow, weird intersections, someone running a red light at 2 a.m. The system has seen it all and learned from it. Waymo's fleet is so small relative to Tesla's that when analysts try to put them on the same chart, Waymo's barely registers. The scale difference is hard to overstate. And this is why timelines are really important. Tesla adds massive mileage every day just from people commuting to work. So when you hear Dan say robo taxis across dozens of cities, he's looking at a company that's already solving edge cases other companies haven't even encountered yet. Waymo is building a data set Tesla already has and the gap keeps growing because Tesla's fleet keeps driving and growing at the same time. The economics are pretty interesting too. A dedicated robo taxi costs way less than a traditional car with a human driver's salary attached. If they can operate at a fraction of current ride sharing costs and still charge competitive prices, the margins get attractive quickly. When you've got that kind of math and you've got the factory capacity to scale production, all you really need is a regulatory green light and enough safety data to back it up. The thing that makes Tesla's approach fundamentally different is is it's a generalized solution. Dan touched on this when he said it tends to work everywhere. Tesla's vehicles have learned how to drive, period. They don't need LiDAR, they don't need pre-mapped cities, they don't need remote drivers watching every move. And that's what makes the multi-city prediction actually believable. Once it works in Austin, 
it works in Phoenix. Once it works in Phoenix, it works in Dallas. The rollout becomes a logistics problem, not an engineering problem. So Tesla's working towards deploying autonomous vehicles at scale, but there's another physical AI bet they're making that could end up being even larger over time. Boston Dynamics showed up on 60 Minutes, demonstrating their humanoid robot working in the Hyundai factory. And the CEO is talking about this moment like it's a major breakthrough. But when you actually look at what they're showing versus Tesla, and what they're doing with Optimus, the competitive dynamic looks a lot like the robotaxi situation. Best place to start with all of the abstract discussion on humanoids this week, frankly, what is it that's changed that's allowed you now to say we have a production version of a humanoid robot? Well, we've been building robots a long time, and so we've figured a lot out about how to, A, build a reliable machine that you could mass produce. And that's what we've introduced at CES this week. We're showing our research version. It's been running, uh, that's the two-hour wait to get into our booth. We've been running demos all week long. Uh, but we announced our, our mass production version that we, uh, we're beginning to build out now. And uh, we're gonna scale production with Hyundai factories so that we'll be building these in the tens of thousands by 2028. There is always gonna be the question, how real is this, right? So you and Hyundai are partners. They're a customer, but you're also working together to continually test. What is it that Alice is gonna be doing in that facility? Is it revenue generating? In other words, is this a real commercial deployment? Absolutely. So look, our humanoid is our third commercial deployment. We've already got two robots out generating revenue today. And so the commercial opportunity is real. What's special about Hyundai is that they're both a, a producer. They can help us mass produce. They can also be a consumer uh, to use robots profitably in their factories. You know, they've defined their own software defined factory uh, initiative and robots are going to be a part of that initiative to make robot, uh, make their factories more flexible and productive. The brain of Atlas, uh, at least in, in, in the inference context, is, is NVIDIA. Um, but a lot of this work you've done yourself on the software side in particular, where would you say Boston Dynamics' core competency is and, and how Atlas reflects that core competency? We've always been the, uh, the whole body coordinated motion first, right? We basically introduce robots like humanoids that could really, in an agile and coordinated way, move around in the world. And so our core competency is in sort of the, the motion control and the low level stuff uh, that's in close proximity to the hardware. We're gonna be teaming with uh, Google DeepMind for the high level cognitive functionality. Right. So that tasks that go over minutes uh, or even longer will be orchestrated by Gemini Robotics. So we're gonna kind of split the low level motor control and, uh, and the high level cognitive control. How you train Atlas in the first instance, particularly in the industrial use case, is fascinating. There is a great emphasis on virtual worlds, digital twins. I think the reality is, you know, teleoperation plays a role here, but how complex is it to get the humanoid robot to interact in a factory facility, taking into account the actual physics of, that's being applied to it in that environment? Well, this is where AI has really provided a breakthrough. We can use simulation tools to uh, coordinate the low-level motion of the robot, so reinforcement learning. Uh, we use teleoperation. If you can teleoperate a robot to do a task in a factory, you can pretty much get an autonomous policy doing that task. So we've already demonstrated that multiple times. What we need to do now is generalize that so that in a day or two, you can train a whole new task. Because ultimately, humanoids are going to need to do hundreds of tasks right. in a factory. So, so therein lies the question, like, right now, what is the problem we're solving for? Literally labor shortages, which Jensen Wong's been talking about all week, or productivity, efficiency gains? You know, what is it that you're selling with your product? Well, the high-level goal is to onshore manufacturing that requires enhancements in labor productivity. And I think robotics have a, have a strong role to play uh, in, that, in that context. You know, uh, demographics are uniform the world uh, ac across. We're seeing declining populations. It's difficult for manufacturers to get the talent that they want. So the robotics is, are going to take the dull, dirty, dangerous parts of the jobs. The humans are still going to do the high level uh, cognitive, uh, high value tasks. Austin Dynamics makes impressive video demos, 
but Tesla's building robots designed to be economically useful from day one, and that's a fundamentally different approach. So the Boston Dynamic clip looks cool, right? The robot can twist, it can turn in unusual ways, it can stand up from weird positions. But if you watch closely, what useful work is it actually doing? It's picking up something long and putting it on a station. That's basically a vice grip with legs. And the robots they showed were completely coordinated in a low traffic corner of the factory. That's not exactly integrated into the production line yet. Here's some history worth knowing. Google bought Boston Dynamics back in 2013, and a lot of people said that's it. Game over, they won robotics. Then Google sold them a few years later. Why? Well, because the leadership kept asking how they could make these robots economically feasible and Boston Dynamics didn't have a clear answer. The humanoid robot was more of a research project that made incredible YouTube videos than a product designed for mass deployment. Now, Hyundai owns them and they're showing similar demos on 60 Minutes. Meanwhile, Tesla's taking a different approach. Elon's been pretty open about this. They're deliberately focused on making Optimus practical and affordable rather than maximizing physical capabilities. The insight is simple. You don't need a robot that does parkour. You need a robot that picks and places parts on an assembly line reliably for thousands of hours. Optimus is being designed with manual dexterity, approaching a human hand with actuators built from scratch because nobody makes the components they need. And the target production cost at scale is supposed to be comparable to a mid-range car and actually maybe even way closer to solve $20,000. The parallel to robotaxis is worth exploring. Boston Dynamics has better brand recognition, more media coverage, way more impressive demo videos. But Tesla has the manufacturing capability, the AI training infrastructure, and a business model built around actually selling and deploying these things at volume. They're building the robot assembly line now. They're planning to deploy units internally first, learn from every hour of operation, and iterate. Same playbook as FSD let the fleet teach the system. By the time competitors figure out how to scale production, Tesla wants to be several generations ahead and ramping volume. Now let's see Dan Ives' top five stock picks for 2026. When we think about the names overall, um, NVIDIA is your number one. Without a doubt, it seems to always be. Uh, Palantir has been a name that you loved. Is that still in the top game for you and why? Yeah, it's what, Nicole, that's one of our top five names for 2026. Like when I look at Palantir, just because in my view, in terms on the software side, that's going to continue to kind of play more and more of a role in terms of what Palantir does. Because AIP, this is really the start of just monetizing the enterprise. And I think the AI story of Palantir, as you go more and more into the commercial, look, only 3% of companies have gone down the AI path. And that's why when I look at Palantir, we've talked about trillion dollar valuation next two or three years, and they're playing a different game. Now, I think others are going to continue to have success in software. MongoDB, Snowflake, a good example. And when you talked about, um, I know you mentioned cybersecurity too, um, but I wanted, you mentioned the top five names 2026. Tell us right now, so in case anybody's not sure, what are your sure. top five names for 2026? Yes, yeah, so that's Tesla, Microsoft, Apple, Palantir, and then in cybersecurity, CrowdStrike. One of our clients started with zero audience. Now they're doing $100,000 months thanks to YouTube. And they're not alone. We've helped three businesses hit that level just by growing them a YouTube channel. Want to see how this could work for your business? Book a call with me below.